Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Live in London. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, filling in for Muhammad Ali, who has had been, who's been granted the opportunity to go perform Hajj. Our prayers are with him. We wish him a safe journey and a most blessed experience in Mecca, inshallah. Please remember us in your du'as and also all the viewers, inshallah. I would also like to take this opportunity to send our condolences to the Ummah and also to the Imam of our time, may Allah hasten his great appearance, as we were commemorating the death of Imam Jawad a couple of days ago. But tonight is the night that we celebrate the anniversary of Imam Ali with Sayyid Fatima. Inshallah, we'll go through our discussion and inshallah, I would like to introduce. Dr. Said Amar Nakshwani. Salaam alaikum, Doctor. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Nice to see you again. Hey, it's a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> thank Looking you good. Much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Sayyidina, let's begin before the marriage. Let's begin in like the early stages of Islam. It was very, very difficult. So Islam at the beginning, trying to establish itself was very, very hard. Did this affect uh, Sayyidina Fatima and, and Imam Ali in any way? Well, their earliest or their earlier years are extremely difficult years. Uh, if you're looking at that first period in Mecca, both of them grow up in extremely difficult circumstances. Uh, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam grows up in a period where there are economic sanctions imposed on her father because of his spread of the religion of Islam. And so what you have is at the age of a few years, she has to witness these sanctions where they are all made to stay in the valley of Abu Talib alayhi salam. And so those early years become even more difficult for her because of the fact that she has to witness her mother, Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam, die and pass away. I think many people don't realize that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, like her father, grew up an orphan. Uh, her mother passed away when she was only five years of age. Now, if we look in the world today, there are certain countries where economic sanctions are placed. In those countries where economic sanctions are placed, in some cases, the children have to face the most turbulent times. So anyone who thinks that Fatima al-Zahra salam's early years were easy, Far from it, you know, she's got a really, really difficult early period of her life. But she remains supportive of her father and has to witness some of the most insulting moments that anyone can ever face with their father. For example, she has to witness the likes of Abu Jahl uh, throwing feces on the head of her father. Abu Jahl would throw feces on the head of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And many of us have read the famous ayah of the Qur'an, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى Have you seen the one who shows or insults our servant when he is in his prayer? Then you had, for example, the likes of Al-As bin Wa'il constantly calling the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family, Abtar, Abtar, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him. There are others calling him Sha'ir, there are others calling him Kahin. There are others calling him Majnoon. And then a pivotal moment where she has to stand up for her father from his own family, Abu Lahab and his wife, Um Jamil. They form a partnership which seeks to hurt the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And with this partnership, what we find is that they want to try their hardest to destroy his message. And part of destroying his message was for them to prepare firewood in his way. And you've read the famous surah, um, where, which talks about Abu Lahab by name and mentions his wife as the one who gathers the firewood. And she, of course, the wife, Um Jamil, would never call the Prophet Muhammad. She would call him Mudhammam. It was an insult towards him. And if he never received any revelation, she would say, Muhammad Shaitan is not sending him any messages anymore. And they'd throw stones at him. And who would be there to look after her father in her earliest years? None other than her. She's standing up for her father against all the insults. So for her, it's a very difficult period, the earliest years of her life. 
And for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the moment the religion of Islam is announced, nobody stood as a protector of the religion alongside the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, like Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and like Sayyidina Khadija alayhi salam. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, if someone wanted to come towards the religion, he's the one who would take them in the, you know, in those dark streets in the night. Or on a hot day in Mecca, he would be the one who'd take them to the Prophet, like Abu Dhar al Ghafari, when he was lost in Mecca and he was wondering, who do I go to? And, and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who takes them to the Prophet. And knowing that these aren't the easiest times, the same Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who is there in the economic sanctions with his father Abu Talib telling him that I want to see you sleep in the bed of the Prophet. I'd rather see you dead and see. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, alive. And this culminates in Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in his early 20s, ready to sleep in the bed of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, on the night of Hijrah. On that night, the night of Hijrah, you find that he finds it an honor to sacrifice his life for God's messenger. There is no state of fear in him. There's no state of grief in him. Because anyone who has conviction that they are doing something for the messenger of God, in turn doing something for God, will never be in a state of grief. That huzun, that fear, that grief will not affect him. Someone who there's a doubt about their iman will have to be told, listen, don't grieve. God's with us. But Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam on the night of Hijra, there's not even an aorta of doubt. And like he says most famously later on, if the veils are removed be between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, my certainty in Allah will not increase or decrease. So both of them tried their hardest in those early years to protect God's message on earth, to protect the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Just a quick reminder that this is a live show and you can call in on 0203 515 with your questions. Alternatively, you can get us on WhatsApp. With the, at the bottom, should be on the lower third, there should be the numbers there, or on Facebook as well. And inshallah, the doctor will be able to answer your question. Sayyidna, come on mate, spill the beans. Was it love at first sight? Or when would you say Imam Ali first ever met Sayyidina Fatima? When exactly they first met, I think obviously it's in Mecca. In terms of, you know, in terms of the building of, I would say, a, a spiritual attraction with each other, it would have to be when Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam escorts the Fawatim, the ladies who are known as, uh, who are known by the name of Fatima, and she wasn't the only one because his mother is, of course, Fatima bint Asad. So he he has a role of escorting them from Mecca to Medina. Because, you know, when he sleeps on the bed of the Prophet that night, the Prophet has also given him other duties. One of those other duties was make sure you return the trusts that have been deposited with me by my enemies. This, is, this sounds paradoxical. Who would... Who would keep their trusts with you? Say, for example, you have a, a gold necklace and you give it to your worst enemy. Or you have jewelry, you give it to your worst enemy. But the Arabs used to know him as the trustworthy one. We don't like you because you're claiming to be a prophet, but you're really trustworthy. Now, hold on. If he's trustworthy, why the doubts? If he's truthful and trustworthy, when have you known him to lie? When have you known him to break a vow or a covenant that he's made with you. You all knew him as Sadiq and they knew him as Amin. So when they knew him with these two titles, they used to leave their trusts. He told Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he said to him, the first thing I want you to do is return the trusts back towards the people who have kept them with me all this time in Mecca. And of course, some people try to scam it, by the way. Some try to come to Imam Ali and say, um, you know what, by the way, um, uh, Muhammad left, uh, you know, I had left some stuff with him and now he's gone. So give me a couple of gold necklaces and give me some. So Imam Ali will be like, can you verify it for me? 
And they'll be like, yeah, 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 we, we left it. And uh, he's like, when did you leave it, for example? And they'll be like, in the afternoon. And then he'll check it up. No, it was in the night that they had left it. Or one would say in the morning, it'd be like, no. And what color was your necklace? One would say, for example, it was uh, white pearls. It turned out to be silver. So there were people who were trying to even scam it with Imam Ali, alayhi salam. The second duty, and this is where I think, in my humble opinion, there is... Uh, uh, a moment of a spark between Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra. And that is when he's taking her from Mecca to Medina with his mom. And what better situation for you to have your future wife with your mom on a journey. Um, and so she's with his mom. But she witnesses not just that he's been willing to sleep on the bed of the Prophet, but she sees that he's willing to give everything even for her as the daughter of the Prophet. He valiantly gets through those rocky roads and mountains from Mecca to Medina. And so when he's getting through these, these mountains, I think at this moment is when Fatima al-Zahra realizes that, you know what, this Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is a special personality. Um, and so if anyone really asks me, when is it that that spark comes? I think it comes from Mecca to Medina as they're doing that hijrah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Sayyid, um, you know, people get married. Some people get married for wealth. Some do it for looks. Some do it for status. Now, say the Fatima being the daughter of Rasulullah, surely there would have been many, many proposals. Who would, wouldn't want their father-in-law to be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? You're right, there were many proposals and uh, proposals from prominent personalities as well. Uh, if you're looking at the personalities who had proposed, you find with these personalities, for example, Abu Bakr, who later on becomes the first caliph, he, is, uh, he proposes. Um, and there is an expectancy that you know, he has been with the, her father for a certain period of time. And that could, you know, maybe give the, the, the brownie points that you need. It's always good to have a relationship with the father of the girl. And um, he's rejected. And then uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab also proposes for Fatima and is rejected. And interestingly, amongst the other companions who had proposed for Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was Abd al-Rahman bin Awf. Now, Abd al-Rahman bin Awf is a wealthy personality. So when he comes to propose, he's thinking, well, the two that have come before me have not really offered much. So I'm willing to offer thousands of gold coins. I'm willing to offer, you know, products from Egypt. You know, I'm willing to give you all the material riches that you want. And I think the Holy Prophet is somewhat disappointed that he's, he's come and just flaunted his wealth. Because there are some people who, if they're going to come and propose, they straight will say, well, you know, I own this, and I own this, and I own that. And I think what they don't realize is that the girls think, well, you own all of these things, and these are going to be helpful for us building our relationship. But do we click? Do we have the main, same mindset? Um, characteristics? Is there charisma in your? Is there physical attraction? And so on. And I think, you know, these are all things which some people, when they're going forward with a proposal, think, well, you know what, if I can just show that I've got a really nice car, that's going to be enough. But what they don't realize is that there's many out there who have beautiful cars and, you know, really nice houses. But what's the point if none of you can even get on with each other? And, um, and so, yeah, there are people who come and propose from different strands of society. Uh, but on each occasion, um, they make no headway. Yeah. So the question for, for myself is, um, you said that, you know, the proposals were rejected. Now... Was this a rejection, a rejection from Rasulullah himself? Or was Fatima, Sayyidina Fatima rejecting these? And even in the early times of, of Islam and in the, early, in the Arabs, were women allowed to choose who they wanted to marry? I think in some cases, women, you know, there were, there were women out there who were able to uh, choose who they wanted to marry. But there were some horrendous cases where they were forced to marry people they did not want to marry. And sadly, this still exists in certain illiterate communities in the Muslim world where there are girls who are forced to marry people they don't want to marry. But the dad said, for example, I've always wanted that cousin to marry you. Yeah, but dad, 
you know, I'm not attracted to that cousin. Or the dad's like, for example, that family can only marry from us and we only marry from them. Okay, but what if there's no spark between us? And sadly, there are many whose lives have been ruined. You know, there are, there are certain uh, women out there who maybe they were in their teens and were forced to marry people three times their age. Wow. Three. When I say three, I mean three. There are certain uh, women out there who were 19 and they had to marry people in their 50s. Um, and why? Because you know what? That person who's come to propose is very wealthy. We have in some cases in Islamic history, a disgusting tribal system. And I'm not surprised when the Qur'an stated that amongst the worst enemies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, were the Bedouins of Arabia. They, you know, their tribal system is more important. If we pick someone for you from the age of two, four, five, then you've got to marry that person. Or if there's someone who's the head of a tribe who's come to propose, you cannot say no to them because this will bring a war. Now, also in Arabia, you had certain women who had to marry their stepsons. Now, I think you'll hear that and you'll say, what are you talking about? And <laughs> yeah. what you have is you've got this, this concept where, say, my dad, my dad's married to my mom, my mom dies, my dad also has a second wife. When my dad dies, I inherit that second wife. I inherit her. She has no choice to say, okay, but that second wife, she was attracted to my dad. Let's say she's 10, 12 years older than me. No, I inherit her. Then you had another type of marriage where they'd force a wife to go and have a physical relationship with their best friend and they'd take his wife. So there was like a wife swapping happening. And, um, and this wife really has no say. You know, the moment the husband says to her, listen, you're going to go and sleep with him and his wife is going to come and sleep with me. And whenever you see a society where, you know, women are treated in this way, when there are women out there who have no say, this is the most oppressive society that exists. And sadly, we've had Muslim communities for years and we've had fathers who have ruined girls' lives by not even telling them about the proposal that's come for them. You see, in this Fatima Zahra, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, marriage, the Prophet, peace be upon him, with every proposal that came, took it to Fatima Zahra. Irrespective of who the person was, the proposal was taken. There are some out there who believe that, well, I don't want him, and I'm sure she doesn't want him. How do you know she didn't want him? Maybe she wanted him. And so the Prophet, peace be upon his family, sets for us a precedent. When someone has come to propose for my daughter Fatima, I will take the proposal to her. She wants to decline, she can decline. When we have in our communities today situations, and you know, many of the youth will email me and Facebook messages and so on, and people will send us messages from far and wide. And many times when they send us these messages, what do they say to us? I'm proposing, but I'm getting rejected. In some cases with Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook. And what other social media are there out there? Hussein, which other social media exist? Other than Twitter. Twitter, Facebook. With all of these things that exist, what you have is that now the... The boy and the girl know each other before that proposal. So the dad may be thinking, well, you know what, really, there's no one who's come to propose. And the girl's thinking, I'm chatting to him behind your back. He said that he sent a proposal. Why are you lying to me? And this could end up breaking families. So yeah, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, he tried to institute this in Arabia. Let's see what the girl has to say. Rather than forcing the girl into a marriage where later on, there are issues that could break the community. Yeah. Say that. So when does Imam Ali come into the picture? I mean, does someone, you know, give him a little nudge and say, look, you know. Yeah, I think so uh, many people. I think giving it. giving a little <laughs> nudge is a good way of putting it. Um, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, you know, is an embodiment of humility, embodiment of you know real class and dignity, and he, 
And he has such awe and respect for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, that, well, do I go, don't I go? And, and that's another beautiful thing about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, that Imam Ali alayhi salam finds it at the end comfortable to go up to the father of the girl he wants to marry. Now, if I was to tell you guys, are you comfortable going up to the father of the girl you want to marry and tell him, listen, I have an interest in proposing for your daughter, um, it's a shame in our societies if that doesn't exist. I remember Nabi Musa alayhi salam, uh, Nabi Shu'aib coming up to him and says, listen, inni uridu an hatain. I want you to marry one of my two daughters, meaning that I'm coming and I'm sending a proposal here. And I, that spirit of Islam, I think, is gone. That spirit of Islam has now become an arrogant spirit, has now begun to be a spirit where we've forgotten our, our decency as Muslims, where we should look out for each other, love for others what we love for ourselves, and take from the example of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. Now, there are you know people out there, they go and propose for marriage, and the family on the other side will tell them, we'll get back to you. Some, they get back to them, but maybe within a few months. Now, I'm not understanding here. You're finishing a PhD or you're answering a proposal for marriage. Some will get back and say, for example, politely, that you know they may have decided to take an istikhara on the issue of marriage and it just didn't work out. And that's something understandable. And... That politeness and respect and that ability to walk up to each other. Imam Ali ibn Talib is influenced by his brother Aqil as well as others who are telling him, listen, what are you waiting for? If anyone's going to get accepted, it's you. And, um, and eventually he tells the Prophet, and it's as if the Prophet's been waiting, but the Prophet says, listen, I've got to ask Fatima. Now when he goes to ask Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, It's very interesting that sometimes the words of a ma'soom are taken as sunnah. Sometimes the actions of a ma'soom are taken as sunnah. Sometimes the silence of a ma'soom on an issue is taken as approval, is taken as sunnah, is taken as a form of, you know, taqrir or tacit approval. And when the Prophet says to her, we have a proposal from Ali, son of Abu Talib. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is Fatima al-Zahra's second cousin. And when she remains silent, with the others it was no. But this time she remains silent. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, says something beautiful that, that moment. First, as he always does, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is great, God is great. Then he says, Sukutuha ridaha. Her silence is her approval. And later when we see the silence of Ahlul Bayt on certain issues, that is a form of approval. And then he says, O oh, Fatima, you have decided to marry the most knowledgeable and the most prudent person on this earth. Meaning that you are marrying a personality that of all of these companions around me, none of them has his ilm. Later on when we see I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate, and for years it was accepted as a tradition. But of course, the, you know, someone who's got darkness in their heart can never have love for Ali. Or they may have love for Ali, but by default. Or they may love people who curse Ali, but still claim to love Ali. But what you have is that he is the gate to the city of knowledge. And so, yeah, it's beautiful. And it's very classy with Fatima Zahra alayhi It's not like, yes, that I really want to marry him. It's just like, Rida. Yeah, it's a beautiful moment. Yeah. Excellent. Sayyidna, marriage and age is a very, very controversial topic in Islam. When we look at Islamic history especially, and we see Rasulullah being accused of so many. How old was uh, Sayyidna Fatima when she married Imam Ali? Would you say she was quite young? Yeah, I'd say I don't think she was older than nine. Nine years old. Nine years of age. Not a problem at that time. The Imam himself was just entering the 24th year of his life. I think it's more problematic when you're discussing the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, because he's in his early 50s when he supposedly marries Aisha. 
who is of that age or around that age, and hence many Muslims will work hard to try and prove that, no, that's not possible. Even though in Arabian culture at the time, there's no hoo-ha being caused. I think there are certain cultures, cities, societies, communities where for years the state allowed people to get married at 11, 12. Um, but I, I don't think she was older than nine when she got married to Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, maybe going into her 10th year. And different climates dictate different biological functions, biological changes uh, of the human body, biological adaptations as well. Um, but yeah, I think you'll find her and Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam, both of them are marrying at around the same time. Yeah. How old is Imam Ali? Roughly yeah, I think he's entering his 24th year. Okay, yeah. mashallah. Sayyidina, couldn't Sayyidina Fatima kind of like stay, you know, celibus, like not get married? A lot of women say that, no, I don't need to get married. Or they think maybe it's a distraction from spirituality, improving their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I think you'll find that in certain, uh, certain parts of Islamic history, there were women who did not get married. And they said that because we want to uh, remain close to God, our servitude to God. Um, you know, we want to stay, for example, studying and learning and getting closer and disseminating God's word. But I think the Imams of Ahlul Bayt make it clear that if staying away from marriage was a form of getting you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Fatima al-Zahra would have stayed away from marriage. Marriage should not be uh, an impediment or an obstacle or a barrier in you uh, gaining closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the contrary, you, you, you you know, hopefully in marriage, you spiritually grow with one another. You spiritually buffer off each other. You spiritually um, are able to disseminate uh, knowledge to one another. You spiritually are able to go on journeys together. And I think it's wonderful when I see families, especially when we go on ziyara, like when we're going on ziyara in Arba'in, when you see the couples who come on ziyara with us, You'll see them going to the haram together. You'll see them listening to lectures together. You'll see them being able to ask questions and seek to gain more knowledge together. So that idea that certain paths of Islam prided themselves over certain women who never got married and therefore had a mystical status, I think Fatima al-Zahra showed that you can have a balance of everything. Yeah. Excellent. Say that. You and I both know this because I'm actually, I know you do a lot of akads and you do a lot of marriages. The mahar sometimes is absolutely ridiculous. What was the mahar between Imam Ali? What's and the most ridiculous Allah? mahar you heard? <laughs> what do you remember? Hundred thousand pounds. Hundred thousand pounds for a yeah. mahar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this was in your culture or no, no, no. <laughs> another community? <laughs> I'm not going to mention, but I think they're famous for riding camels. The what, famous for riding camels. Well, that narrows it down to quite a few <laughs> Arabian countries. Um, mind you, you'll find that it varies. And it's very sad when we reach a stage where the dowries are so high. Because I, I have a lot of respect for people when they say the mahar is the mahar of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. You know, when you go to listen to certain marriages or certain yeah. nikahs, you always hear them saying that the mahar is the mahar of Fatima. What do they mean when they say the mahar of? Fatima. What they mean is that when it came down to deciding the dowry, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, asks uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, what can you offer for the dowry? Now, the Holy Prophet, if you notice in many legal traditions, he, find, he tries to help people out when it comes to dowry, when it comes to even kafara. Um, I remember when I was studying the chapter on Dihar. Dihar is when Arab men would insult their wives by saying, you are to me like the back of my mother. Meaning in the same way I cannot have a relationship with my mom, I cannot have a relationship with you. And this used to be a real insult. And, and the Quran would say there's a kafara for that pronouncement. You can't turn around to your wife and say to her, you're like my mom. That's an insult to your Misses and um, and the prophet would try and you know tell them listen can you free a slave um, and you know you'd find some of them would turn around and say well I, I don't really own one and inshallah in a couple of weeks we'll be looking at you know sex slaves and discussing um, the legal aspects of it as a part two to the lecture that I had given last year in Muharram but 
what you have is the freeing of the of the slave if they can't then he'd say to them you know fast consecutive days no arabs doing 60 days in a row um, and if you could feed the poor and then he'd try and help them and i think what happens is we need this in our communities that when people are trying to get married a the parents don't make things extra tough and b the community should seek to come together i i i love the fact that for example now in Iraq, we have um, the Mawadda project. Um, and that Mawadda project, you find uh, the likes of, you know, Sheikh Muhammadi, for example, in Karbala and others, in conjunction with Imam Al-Hussein TV, working their hardest to bring people together. It doesn't matter, Shia, Sunni, Christian, it doesn't matter. Those who are trying to get married, maybe can't afford to get married, come and try and help them. And I think the community has a major responsibility that when someone's getting married, we should try and help them from the beginning. Proposal we should help. Reference we should help. Wedding day we should help. And not by, you know, giving toasters and things like this. You know, I, I, no wonder they stopped doing, no wonder they said no more box <laughs> gifts. You know, you, you know, someone has a real um, fascination with toasters for some reason. And sometimes people give you uh, used products or buy one, get eight free or things like this. And it really shows the lack of class in certain people. But, but I think we need to help on every level. So he tells Imam Ali, what can you do? And Imam Ali says, this, I can offer my sword or my shield or I can offer the camel that I used to, that I have. And so the Prophet says to him, that as for your your camel or the animal that you have, use that to continue to irrigate the water and use it to earn an income. And as for your sword, use it to help defend the religion. But as for your shield, which some argued was from the spoils of the Battle of Badr, then that shield, sell it, and the amount that you get, 480 or 500, I don't know, whatever it is, use that as the mahar for Fatima. So, it's vital that whether you're a father today whose daughter has got, is going to get married, try and take from the son of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, and make things easier for that person who's proposed. Yeah. What about the sunnah or the method and the wedding itself? I mean, sometimes these weddings are extravagant, hugely cost. It costs more than the mahr sometimes. Yeah, some weddings are, you know, some weddings are extravagant. Some are, you know, damn right stingy. Um, and we don't want, you know, both extremes. When I say stingy, I don't mean that the location that's been picked is a bad location. I've been to I've been to a wedding which was done in the underground basement of a mosque oh, wow. that had dampness everywhere. However, there was there was a purity of heart and generosity in the food that was served. Oh, okay. So although the surroundings weren't luxurious, but everything, they, you know, they just wouldn't stop serving food and, and, you know, different desserts and starters and so on. So when I say damn right stage, I'm not talking about those people who, for example, um, who have simple weddings. You can have a luxurious wedding, but that luxurious wedding, you could tell that, you know what, you've done it in a luxurious place, but there's not much generosity coming from you. And I think... When it comes to Imam Ali alayhi salam's wedding with Fatima Zahra, um, I think there isn't too much concern that we have to have a flash event. I think they're just happy that they're finally together. And I think that's what many of us fail to come to terms with when we got married. That, you know what, everyone's going to tell you where you're doing it or what's happening or what's going on in the day. But when it comes down to it, if, while you two have got together and you're happy about getting together, that should be the most important thing. Your parents are smiling. The community is happy for you, and that's it. And I, I do think sometimes, you know, we take it or we took it too seriously, a lot more than we needed to. And with them, look at her, like she's ready to give away her dress. You know, anyone who knocks at that door, that Fatima Zahra alayhi salam's door was the door of generosity. Ironically, it becomes the door that leads to her martyrdom. But I think what you notice is that, you know, we, we, we go crazy about the suit that we're wearing or the dress that we're wearing and it has to be 
you know, I want to make sure that my suit is fitted on time and perfect and everything goes well on time. And the, the dress that I'm wearing, you know, there are many girls who may have, uh, you know, it may suffer a real um, moment of pressure leading up to the day. Um, and there are some people who are getting ready and so on. And you've got this Fatima and Ali are extremely relaxed on that day. And the Prophet Peace Be Upon His Family is also very relaxed. You know, it's tell the companions, you guys, if you can help out, can you buy a couple of rugs? Can you get like a couple of cushions? Can you try and get some wood? Can you? Okay. Yeah. Done. Let's do the nikah. Thank you all so much. Let's have a walima. You know, and I think Muslims from the moment of da'wah to al-ashira, we could tell that food was important. Indeed. You know, and I think... The Prophet, peace be upon him, his family shows wonderfully that, listen, we'll have a nice walima, people can come, enjoy a nice meal, and then and they move on. And I, and I do sometimes wonder, you know, that same spirit. Yeah, I don't have a problem if someone does a wedding in a, in a, in a very luxurious place. Um, and then you see people who, no, decided that the, instead of spending that money, they'll give it to orphans out there, or they'll give it to the poor out there, which I think is a wonderful gesture. I don't think there's a problem with people doing it in a very simple environment. But they'll do it in a way where they're very generous with the food that's being served. And I think if you're looking at the day of that wedding, there's a real thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence in our Islamic traditions, that on the night of your wedding, the day of your wedding, there's meant to be a, a sense of thanking God as well. There are many people who may get married and on the night they return, for example, to their homes. They don't wake up for Fajr, for example. Now you have just been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attend a wedding or to be married. First thing you and your wife, the Fajr. And, um, and you'll find that there are some known that go to sleep or some will come back home late but not think about Fajr whereas we are told, read a dua, thank Allah for this night. You know, and this builds, this builds your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said If it wasn't for Ali, then there would be no kufu for Fatima Zahra What was meant by this hadith? Well, I think there was um, There was no one who could come near Fatima Zahra alayhi salam You know, personalities You know, firstly she's Sayyid at Nisa al-Alameen She is seen as the lady of the heavens, you know Asiya, Maryam, Khadija All of these you know, uh, for they make the greatest woman to have ever lived in the history of the religion of Islam. But I think when it came to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, not only she found her match, she found someone above her. As we know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is revered as being higher um, than everybody except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And this is a source of pride for us as the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. You know, people come and, uh, you know, try and say, you guys take Ali too high, we're honored. You know, I don't, don't make no um, apologies. qualms, apologies, no reservations about saying it. I don't think uh, actually we've made Ali high. I think we've actually studied 0.1% of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anyone out there who claims they know Ali ibn Abi Talib, I think only Allah and Rasulullah know him. Uh, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So nobody could come near her. And the only person who could come near and was her imam and was higher than her in his status and his knowledge and his spirituality was the man she loved the most and she married, yeah. MashaAllah, excellent. So with your permission, we're going to go to a short break, sure. inshallah. Please join us after the break. We will be, inshallah, taking your questions and the doctor will be answering them, inshallah, on the topic of the marriage between Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you after the break.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London, where we're discussing the marriage between Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Just a quick reminder to all the viewers that this is a live show, and you can call in on 0203 515 If you have any questions, and inshallah, the Sayyid will be able to answer them for you. Alternatively, you can get us on WhatsApp or Facebook. Sayyidina, we've been talking about the marriage, we talked about the mahar, you know, uh, the, the actual wedding itself. Was there any honeymoon, you know, any Maldives or Dubai, Jamaica perhaps? Yeah, none of those, unfortunately, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think uh, some of those may not have been discovered at that time. Uh, but what you have is, yeah, there's a honeymoon, and it's the Battle of Uhud. Oh, wow. Um, not the most luxurious honeymoon in the world and not the nicest place to be. But really, I think it solidifies a marriage because of the fact that they begin their marriage seeking to protect the religion, seeking to protect the legacy of the teachings of God and the, um, and, uh, that are embodied by the Prophet, peace be upon his family. And it's not easy for any wife. You know, the first year of marriage, it's not easy. There are tests that you face with your, with your husband. But I don't think many wives out there who are facing a test uh, in the first year of their marriage have to treat many wounds on the body of their husband. Imam Ali ibn Talib salam's performance in every battle is phenomenal. There is no one in the history of the religion of Islam who comes near the valor and the bravery of Ali ibn Abi Talib I think Shuja'a is really a servant of Ali and learns from Ali. Um, and so what you have is that in the battle of Uhud, the Qur'an mentions how the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, run away from the battle. There's many texts trying to cover and hide and protect. And no, the Qur'an says in uh, chapter 3 that وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ عَقَابِكُمْ The Qur'an says uh, Muhammad is but a messenger and messengers have come before him. If he dies or rather he is killed, you turn your back on him, you turn on your heels. And, and these companions, you know, absolutely, in, you know, ran away on that day. And the hadith books are clear as to their running. And one thing Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib can never be accused of is running away from battle. There are others out there who maybe now in the books, which the Umayyads and the Abbasids more wrote, have praised people as being brave and so on. But many have a history of running away. And with Imam Ali alayhi salam, no, he stands there, protects the Prophet from the onslaught of Khalid ibn al-Walid and, you know, a great number of the opposition on that day, on the day of Uhud. There's no way Khalid ibn al-Walid can come near the dust of Ali ibn Abi Talib in war or in battle. Um, absolutely no chance whatsoever. Uh, Khalid ibn Walid record when you're looking at um, at his wars with the Prophet. You know, I don't, I don't really think uh, there's much to admire. There's not much done at Hunayn. There's not much done at Mu'ta. And and in terms of when he's an enemy of the Prophet at Uhud, he tries to kill the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his time, but he can't. Ali ibn Abi Talib will always be there. But Fatima al-Zahra is there at Uhud. And you'd think that as the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, she'd turn around and she'll be like, well, I'm the daughter, I should be on a carriage, gold carriage, I'm, you know, the daughter of the leader of the community and so on. No, uh, she comes and treats the wounds of her husband. Yes. And it really is amazing that some of us really live in an in an imaginary world, in a dream world, where we think that our marriages have to be perfect, or they imagine that the Ahlul Bayt never had difficulties in their marriages. We remember Imam al Jawad a couple of days ago, he was you know, poisoned by his wife. Imam al Hassan was poisoned yeah, by his wife. Poisoned. The Prophet had certain wives who divulged the secret as per chapter 66, verse number 3 of the Holy Quran. And likewise, you have here Imam Ali ibn Abi Sahra. It's, it's a very difficult start to their relationship. But I think that cements their relationship. And I think sometimes when you see certain people out there who've had long-lasting marriages, they'll tell you the early days were difficult. The early days were tr full of trials. But uh, yeah, that was their honeymoon. Uh, so it wasn't as exotic as some of us, uh, you know, who, who may want to go to these wonderful holiday resorts. Uh, and maybe sometimes that's a reminder to us uh, as to 
just how easy some of us have it. Yeah. So you, know, you were mentioning, you know, they, they got married. It's very difficult at the beginning of that hood. And then on top of that, the first four years, say the Fatima has Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, say the Zainab. Surely this is just it's a bit too much for say the Fatima. Really, really difficult times, no? Well, I don't, I don't really think they're the most difficult times because she has those children. Yes, Imam al Hassan, Imam Hussein, said Zainab are, uh, are born within four years of each other. You know, three kids in four years. You know, in that period, it's extremely difficult for you know a mother biologically there are some you know some people don't appreciate the mothers and and in some cases what difficulties they face after giving birth there are some who are insulted because they don't look like they did on the wedding day although if the guy looks in the mirror you know he <laughs> may have to explain himself there are others who for example are insulted uh, because they're they may not be physically wanting what they wanted before. Yeah, but they're, they're, there's bodily changes happening. There's some who go through periods of depression. Um, but with Fatima Zahra, السلام, you, you notice there's a very, very dignified manner of respect with everything that's happening in the house. And there's these, what one may call hagiographical stories, but they are there within the literature um, of incidents where Seemingly, she's pale from the work she's doing at home. She's tired, but she never complains to the imam. She may tell her dad that things aren't easy, and her dad tells her, you know what, I'll give you something which is the best. And that is the tasbih of Fatima al-Zahra. Allahu Akbar 34 times. Alhamdulillah 33 times. Subhanallah 33 times. You know, when people finish salah, some people, as soon as they finish salah al-Maghrib, get up straight away. Some people, as soon as they finish salah, read dua straight away. For example, Allahumma anni as'aluka mujibati rahmatik wa azayin al-akhiratik wa najat min al-nar wa min kulli baliyah. Then there is a third group of people who straight away will go to the tasbih of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And that tasbih of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is really a spiritual cure for all of us. And Imam al-Sadr goes to the extent of saying whoever recites the tasbih of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Exactly the minute they finish their salah, so for example, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and then 34 times, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, and Subhanallah, 33 and 33, they, you know, they'll be protected from the fire of hell. She also had the help of Fiddha, and we should never forget Fiddha's help, but it's not like Fatima Zahra was just like telling Fiddha, okay, you do everything. No, a day for you, a day for me. I think what keeps her strong in this period as well is her Salat al-Layl, I think that becomes... Fundamental in all the lives of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, you know, that there's this real love for Allah and, and that then makes the way they bring up their children and and the service that they're giving towards their Lord, it gives them peace. I think sometimes in our communities, when there are young mothers who have three, four kids, they the husband needs to recognize at those moments the odd Ziara journey may be beneficial for that relationship the odd holiday the odd change of atmosphere so i think these are pointers which we can take yeah saying that a lot of women these days now this is not a bad thing but they want to go out and work and um you know say the fatima was you know very content with being a housewife i mean for our sisters out there can we do both and gain spiritual benefit or not from both I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Uh, I think what Fatima Zahra displays is that there is a divine element to being a housewife. There, there, there's, there's something unique there because it seems very mundane. There are many ladies in our communities who have excelled in their education, who are phenomenal role models in terms of the perseverance and the strength they had to study to maintain their chastity and modesty while studying a lot more than us guys and many of them deserve to go on and work and all of them have the right to go on and work and they don't need to bring any of that money back home the onus is on the husband responsibility of the husband to maintain the household I think what Fatima Zahra does is that she just shows hold on you looking after those kids don't look at as a backward step for you, there's a divine element to this. In your service, bringing up these kids, in turn, you're serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're serving the prophetic message. And that's why it's very beautiful how many 
admire Fatima the Zahra alayhi salam. But what's interesting is that sometimes they'll say, but I don't want to be a housewife. Yeah, but if you admire her, admiring her for which part of her life? Because the majority of her life is spent at home. Then when you say, why are we made to be housewives or spend life at home and so on, then which part of Fatima is it exactly that you admire? She seems to find pleasure serving in the household. She doesn't look at it as a box I have to take on an application form. What's your job? Doctor, nurse, engineer, housewife. No. There is a divine element that she instills there. And I think sadly many times in our community, the Muslim women are not shown that respect that what they're doing is divine. The man going out and earning a living is ensuring the obligatory is done. Whereas what the, wom what the women in our community are doing is, is, is showing a real divine element to their upbringing of those kids, to the instilling of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt to those kids. Very inspirational. Sayyidina, very controversial question. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this. But do, do we see Sayyidina Fatima, you know, interrogating Imam Ali at any time? Where have you been? What's going on? You haven't called, you haven't texted, or, you know, where, what's this, what's that? Really, really getting uh, in his face, really, really like, you know, uh, trying to get involved in his life, um, which, you know, you know, to a limit that's acceptable. Like today, do we, you know, we see a lot of women who are like, you know, stuck to their husbands, like, like glue. Where, where are you? Let's get Elich Abu Saham in yeah. Iraq. You'll hear some people saying that my wife is a lesga. And even over here, and, you know, in many parts of the world, he says she's a lesga. When I say she's a lesga, meaning she sticks to me. I go out for one minute. Where are you? Text me. This, that. And sometimes it's the guy's fault. Because the guy's either done something complete, really, you know, he's messed up one time and she's going to be after him nonstop. Um, and I think sometimes absence really does make the heart grow fonder as well. There are some who, yes, there are some who'll check up, you know, who you with. Send me a picture. Where are you? What time are you coming home? Why not? And so on. And, um, and what you find with Fatima Zahra alayhi salam is no, on the contrary, I don't think, I think firstly she has, you know, the most impeccable human being living. Um, you know, anyone who's, who's been raised by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is going to be an impeccable human being. So she's got nothing to worry about when he's out. But when he is out, you know, in those first years, one minute, Khandaq, Khaybar, Hunayn, and so on. And never do you find her saying, why do you go to every battle? Why is it that you're always in the mosque? Why is it that, for example, you're always with my father and so on? Uh, and maybe there's a, there's a message there that, listen, you stick close with each other, build a bond. But sometimes allowing that space really makes that relationship grow. Now, I know there are some ladies probably out there saying, how do I allow him space? Do you know if I allow him space, <laughs> the, the trouble that's going to be caused, and I don't trust him, and so on. And listen, everyone's got their own relationships. Everyone's got their own, you know, certain pasts, Indeed. things that have happened in history. If you're asking me, Fatima, she's sticking to Imam Ali everywhere? No, that let's get element, I don't think, was, was there. But then again, the man she's married, you really don't need to worry about anything. Yeah. Sayyidina, you were mentioning that Sayyidina Fatima, you know, being in, in the house and was very content with being a housewife. But we also know that she was present at Mubahila. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that as, as a symbol of Islam, as representing Islam. Could you comment on this please? Well, I think I find it beautiful that God wants this, this woman to be the one who is representing the religion. As per Surah 3 verse 61, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ So this ayah, the Christians have come to meet the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And what's interesting is that when you want to take a delegation to meet the Christians of Najran, there are many who will say that Islam was always, you know, led by a, a patriarchal worldview with male chauvinists who in many cases were misogynists and so on. But the God of the religion has no qualms about making sure that a woman goes to meet 
a delegation of Christians in what is a very sensitive issue, a mubahala being a call on God to, uh, you know, you know, uh, curse those who are seen as disbelievers. And so when Fatima Zahra is the one um, who is chosen by the Prophet to go towards the Mubahala, Imam Ali has no problem. His wife being in public, his wife representing the religion, his wife being in a political issue and a theological issue. And sometimes people, when they mention examples, they always say Sayyidah Zainab salam in Sham or in Kufa as an example of a lady who was in public. But I think that was in coercion or under duress or in compulsion, you know, she was forced to be there. Whereas Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam on the event of Mubahala, there are other wives the Prophet Muhammad could have taken, peace be upon his family, with him. But he doesn't take them. And I think that's wonderful that he takes the young Fatima to represent the religion of Islam. And I think we need to encourage in our communities for a few things. More programs where the men and the women are sitting in the same hall rather than the woman have to always be looking at the speaker from a screen. When in reality, many of the women in our community have more passion for learning than the men. I think there needs to be an increase in men being willing to listen to a female speaker because I don't care about your gender. I'm more interested in what ilm comes from you. And what knowledge is coming from you. That needs to increase. We should encourage more of our daughters to be involved in political roles in our communities and external of our communities. We have, for example, in the West, many of our sisters who have been phenomenal in representing the religion or the community. It doesn't have to be the religion. It could be the citizens of the country. And I think Fatwa Tizara and also Imam Ali not having an issue with it. You know, Imam Ali doesn't turn around and say, you stay at home. Or Imam Ali doesn't turn around and say, you know what, we've never had women talk in public. We've never, no, no. Imam Ali, you know what, represent the religion. This is an important pivotal moment. So it really is a, a unique event. That one which you can examine from so many angles. Very inspiring. Yeah. So I believe we have a call on the lines, inshallah, we'll to take the question. Salaamu Alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? I'm afraid we can't. Uh, inshallah, we, we've got some yeah, technical go difficulties. Inshallah, we'll be able to get back to that caller. Please call again and inshallah, we'll be able to take your question. Uh, Sayyidna. Some say Imam Ali married a, uh, you know, a second wife when he was married to Sayyidina Fatima. Some say it was Abu Jahl's daughter, Jawariya. And this angered Sayyidina Fatima. Is there any evidence for this? Well, it exists in the narrations that Imam Ali uh, proposed for the daughter of Abu Jahl, Jawariya. Uh, but you'll find that this can be something which can be disproven on a variety of levels. You know, um, if you're looking at, for example, the Prophet suddenly getting angry when he hears the news that Imam Ali alayhi salam um, has interest in Abu Jahl's daughter and then all of a sudden saying it's forbidden for Ali to marry anyone. Why is it forbidden? The Quran says mm -hmm. that you can marry how many? Four. Four. And so why would it be forbidden to Ali? Just because he's married to Fatima? No, it's not forbidden. And so that contradicts, you know, anything that Rasulullah would never say something like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Secondly, if you're looking at some of the people in the chain, some of the narrators, you know, like Al-Karabis al-Baghdadi, or, you know, Maswara bin Maqram and people like that, these are all known enemies of Ali. You know, there are certain personalities who are known for their bogh of Ali, their hate of Ali. Don't get me wrong, there'll still be mashayikh who'll say, but they are thiqah, we trust them, but even if they hate Ali. And these people all will try and ensure that they find a black dot in the character of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But however many people will come and try and attack Imam Ali ibn Abi, ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, makes no difference. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is a person who lives on forever. Number three, I just think that this hadith was done as a cover-up for the hadith Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Okay. So, well, it's Imam Ali who angered her because he wanted to provide her as a cover-up for other things. Uh -huh. yeah. Sayyidah, I do believe we have a call in, shall we have to get through to him this time. Salaamu Alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum. 
having more technical difficulties. I think you either fix. I think, I think you either fix. You either fix <laughs> the phones or don't pass on calls. Yes, go ahead. Inshallah. Yep. Um, next question, Sayyidna. Who were the closest friends to Sayyidna Fatima? I mean, we know that like, girls like to have friends, like to talk, and also sometimes the husband doesn't really necessarily like his wife's friends, or there may be that one individual they think is a bit. You know, a bit shaky. Well, sometimes, you know, like you know, sometimes the wife doesn't like her <laughs> husband's friends, you know. Yeah, sure. It works both ways. Um, I think her best friends really in that period you're looking... I think her mother-in-law is the best friend to her for that first part of the marriage, for the first three, four years. She loves Fatima Mint Asad. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, used to love Fatima Mint Asad. And if, uh, you know, I remember reading, I think it was in the book al Isti'ab where it was mentioned that when he wanted to have a, a, a siesta, you know, like a sleep middle okay. of the day, he'd go and sleep in Fatima bint Asad's place, go and relax away from everyone, because he saw her like his mom. Um, Asma bint Umais, very close to Fatima bint Zahra. Uh, Sayyidah Fidda alayhi salam, very close to Fatima bint Zahra. Um, I'd say, yeah, I'd say these are probably the ladies who were the closest to Fatima bint Zahra, yeah. And if, for example, someone says, um, I have a problem with my wife's friends. If your wife's friends are bringing her closer to Ahlul Bayt, have the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt and so on, there's no issue there. Yeah. Excellent. Final question before I go on to the WhatsApp questions. Do we see the Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu get involved in interfering the marriage between Imam Ali and Sayyidina Fatima? And what sort of you know, advice and lessons can we learn uh, from this sort of relationship? That we can pass on because sometimes we have too many family members actually interfering in the marriage and not allowing the husband and wife to deal with it themselves and to bond and grow from this. Yeah, I think parents out of their love sometimes have to have a say on everything in a marriage. And I think I think it comes from a, a good place, but the way it's expressed sometimes it leaves a lot to be desired. And um but with the Prophet peace be upon his family, there's no interference there. You know, that that incident you mentioned about Imam Ali proposing for Abu Jahl's daughter. That's probably one of the moments where people were like, this is when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, became angry with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Um, and, you know, that's an absolute load of nonsense. On the contrary, he doesn't interfere. Rather, the, the only thing I'd say where he interferes is in such positive moments. He either comes past their house, sends his salams to them, and then continues. Or... Uh, he'll tell them, you know, how's Hassan and Hussein? Because he loved them so much, his grandchildren. And, th and they'll reply, they're good, but they may not be feeling well. Then he'll say to them, okay, then make a nidr that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps them regain their strength, you will fast for three days. And you know the famous ayah, innama nut'imukum li wajhillah, was revealed uh, from Surah al-Dahr in, in, in honor of the food they gave to the miskeen and the yatim and the asir. Or sometimes the only other interference, there's always a positive interference, <laughs> was when he'd come home for, uh, for dinner. Um, and it's not an interference, but you know, he'll, he'll suddenly tell Imam Ali, you know, I'm coming home. And, and Imam Ali would come to Fatima Zahra and she'd be like, well, I don't have much here. But the, the Lord who sent Jibra'il to feed Maryam will also ensure that Jibra'il has food for Fatima. Yeah. So now with your permission, uh, we have Hussein Jawad from Sydney, Australia, commenting saying that is the age difference that big? This, surely this is absurd. Uh, absurd in terms of what? The between age difference the age between? between? Say the Fatima and Imam Ali, I'm assuming, because that was the topic of the discussion. Uh, then what would he think of the Prophet's marriage to Aisha? <laughs> um, you know, in those days, they seem to have certain norms. Um, and each culture has their different norms. I remember in the States, there were certain states within America who would have the marriages legalized at 12. And this was only until recently. Oh, wow. So, let alone in that Arabian society, you know, there was, there was, um, there was a norm there at the time. Um, and nor was there any hoo-ha about it. Yeah. What about today, Say that Do you think that no, there's an age no, limit no. that we should... Uh, I think today it's absurd. It's absurd to marry... Um, you know, someone nine years of age, it's absurd. Um, and the norms of society have changed. Um, and it's not something which we, or the grand scholars um, even 
push that even in Iraq when people try, wanted to push Ayatollah Sistan it's going in that direction no um, and if it occurs I think it's an oppression Another one here, Salam, is marriage mandatory in Islam? What if someone doesn't want to get married because they've seen unsuccessful marriages and they're kind of put off? Well, the, what I would always be told is if, you've, if you don't want to get married because you've seen unsuccessful marriages, then you haven't met the right person. Mm -hmm. Just wait till you meet the right person and you have that click and then you'll want to get married. And marriage in Islam becomes mandatory if you know that by not being married you will fall into sin. A very interesting question here. Did Imam Ali or any of the Imams marry non-Shia wives? Did they have any non-Shia wives? Well, I think um, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, and Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam, one may argue that amongst their wives there were people whose theology would not necessarily be seen as, you know, Shi'i in that early period. Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Jawad, when Imam al-Jawad marries al-Ma'moon's daughter, so I think that's pretty obvious. Imam al-Hasan marries uh, Ja'dah, the daughter of al-Ash'ath bin Qais. I don't think al-Ash'ath or his son Muhammad, I don't think these could be classified as Shi'i Imamis who believed in Nas and Asma and um, ilm from God um, and Imam al-Baqir certainly had a wife who I remember had insulted Imam Ali salam, on one occasion and that some argue led to a separation so yeah not necessarily all of them yeah controversial question here Sayyidna um, what is the Sayyid's opinion in regards to those who cannot get married because they're not a virgin anymore yeah, I think, I think that's ridiculous in all honesty. Everyone, uh, you know, you find the right person, you want to marry them. Um, and just because someone is, is not a virgin, that shouldn't be something that gets in your way. Um, you know, at the end, people have, have made decisions in their life. People change, people move on. In some cases, people haven't even done anything wrong. In some cases, they may be divorced and they want to move on. And even if they have done something which is classified religiously as wrong, the door of repentance never closes. So for someone to turn around and say, you know, a girl has to be a virgin for me to marry her, no, 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 not at all. A person, you keep the door open like you want Allah to keep the door open for you to both progress in life. Um, and I think there are many more important things than that. Yeah. I was going to say that. Final thought for anyone, please. Well, I just, I just hope that we can reflect on the, you know, the simplicity and the class of of the marriage of Imam Ali and Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And I think every day any of you face difficulties in your marriages, or those of you who haven't got married, just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, you know what, just let me feel a bit of what Imam Ali alayhi salam felt for Fatima. And I think the way I say that is very important because the wordings that he uses, you know, when he when he says that you know, half of me departed from this world, my nights are full of sorrow. You know, when he talks about a flower came from heaven, went to heaven, left its fragrance in my mind. You know, these types of words really highlight um, an emotive aspect of Imam Ali bin Talib that I hope we can all, especially as men, um, build for our wives. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Inshallah, we'll be back next week. I'll be joining you, Inshallah, next week again. Until then, uh, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah Wabarakatuh.